Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to be starting there in verse 14. Uh, I, before I uh, begin today, I want to just say a special word of thank you. Uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I want to say thank you to so many people who have uh, reached out in various ways with cookies and cinnamon rolls and cards and, and all kinds of things. I uh, just want to say it really is a privilege to serve here at Heritage. And I want to say a special word of thank you to Pastor Jason and uh, Tony, as well as Pastor Kevin and Tammy. It truly is a joy uh, and an incredible joy and gift in my life to be able to serve alongside brothers in the faith and fathers in the faith who I deeply respect and admire. So thank you so much for everything that you do, and uh, I love you very much. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Today, we are going to continue along the same thread that we've been going over the last six weeks, which is, we've been looking at our church mission statement, which says, we exist to reach those who are far away from God, to restore the broken, and recreate authentic followers of Christ. We've been looking at that mission statement, and we've been seeking to kind of unpack what does that look like in the life of us as individuals and in the life of Heritage Baptist Church as a whole. And that mission statement, by the way, is just a synthesis, really, of the Great Commission. Reach, restore, and recreate. We spent a lot of time talking about reaching, and I hope that you're continuing to pray uh, for that individual that God placed on your heart, or, or multiple individuals. We talked about restoring the broken and the importance of being open before God and letting Him restore us, letting Him do His healing and empowering work in our lives. And this week, we're going to turn the, the last turn and move toward recreating authentic followers of Christ. And as, as we're diving into this part of the series, there's a word that's really going to stand out over the next few weeks, and it's this word authentic. What does it mean to be an authentic follower of Christ? Now, here's the reality. When it comes to being a follower of Christ, we still live in a culture where a lot of people claim to be Christians, but don't necessarily have an authentic relationship with the Lord. In fact, I would even argue we live in a culture, and this may not be true in every area of the country. It's certainly not true in every area of the world, but in Southwest Missouri, where we live, there is still a cultural currency. There is still a status. There is still an advantage that goes to being uh, with being called a Christian that many people have an incentive to say, well, yes, I'm a believer, even if they not, might not be truly a follower of Jesus. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit more what I mean by that in a second, but I want to say up front, this is not something new. In fact, if you know something about the, the history of the Christian faith, at the very beginning, being a Christian could cost you your life. And, and we see this even in the New Testament. People who said, you know, I had to lay down my life to follow Christ or the blood of the martyrs that was shed very early on. It could cost you your life to be a Christian. But over time in the Roman Empire, here's basically what happened. Enemy, uh, Christians went from being enemies of the state, people considered, you know, worthy of death at the hands of the lions kind of people, to over time there were many Christians and it continued to grow and the Roman government recognized, hey, we're not going to blot out these guys. So there was a movement from enemies to now, okay, we're going to allow Christians to live among us to eventually the Roman Empire would adopt Christianity as the religion of the empire. And this was a movement that took a, a few hundred years to happen, but especially under an emperor, you may have heard of him, named Constantine, Christianity became something that was no longer rejected, but now it was accepted. And in fact, people began to realize, if I want to kind of move up the social ladder, if I want to make a name or a career, I have to claim to be a Christian. Now, of course, what does it do whenever there's some kind of motivation or incentive for someone to claim to be a Christian even when they're not? Well, what does it do? It waters down the faith. It basically opens the door up for someone to say, well, I may not actually believe. I may not trust in Christ as my Savior. I may not want to actually follow his ways, but I'm willing to say that I'm a Christian I'm willing to claim that I'm a follower of Christ even if I'm not. And here's what I would pose to you. It's not a new problem. It's happened really from the, almost the beginning of the church. But here's the thing. Especially in the Western culture, there has been a currency. There's been a status. There's been an advantage and an incentive for people to say, I'm a Christian even when they're not. 
They might know, well, to, to get this job, yeah, it might look good if, if people know I'm a Christian. Or to, to be in this group of people, it might look good to say, well, I go to church here. Or to, to, to have this public position, it might be good. I mean, I may not actually believe, but at least if I say that I do, these people will vote for me or whatever it might be. There is still that kind of cultural status that comes with being a Christian, which raises the question, how can we be the real deal? How can we be authentic in a world where there's still an advantage to being a fake? How can we be an authentic follower of Christ? Well, Paul understood this, which is why we're going to dive into 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul understood this idea, and he's going to give us a metaphor as we look at this question. What does it mean to be an authentic follower of Christ? He's going to give us a metaphor that Christians are called to be the aroma of Christ. The aroma of Christ. Now, we're going to take that and we're going to kind of uh, weave that through the message as, as we look at the text and look how Paul uh, states it to the Corinthians. But before we dive in here, here's kind of the backdrop of 2 Corinthians. One, as we talked about last week, Paul had already written a letter to the Corinthians that really kind of sounded harsh to them, but he was calling them to repent of a very specific sin. Having received word that they did repent, that they turned away, Paul writes them another letter that's a little bit more fatherly in its tone. It's a little bit more, hey, I love you so much. But he also is writing to them to say, hey, uh, by the way, I was planning to come to you in person, but I'm no longer going to be able to make it. In other words, the first two chapters of 2 Corinthians are kind of like his change in travel itinerary. I was going to come to you, but now I'm not. Don't think I was a liar. I really intended to, but God kind of changed the plans. You say, well, why do we need to know Paul's travel itinerary? Here's why. Because immediately before the verses we're going to dive into, he basically says, okay, I couldn't come, but I want you to recognize what it's like whenever someone does come to you. I want you to recognize what it's like whenever a true believer, whether it's a pastor or a missionary or an apostle like Paul was, when someone truly comes who is an authentic follower of Christ, he gives this metaphor of what it should be like, of what it should look like. And as we're going to see with the metaphor of aroma, he says this is what it should smell like to be a true follower of Christ. Now, I, I want to dive into the text, but uh, you, you, may, you may sense a lingering scent in this service. I've got a can of Axe body spray here, and here's why. Scent science tells us is, is the sense that is strongest tied to memory. And I'm about to give you some brain information here. Anytime someone tells you this is how the brain works, by the way, just have an asterisk by it because truly we don't know how the brain works. But scientists think that sin is strongest tied to our memory. And here's why. Because all of our other kind of sensory, uh, sensory perception it goes through basically a middleman. We sense, it goes through our nerves, but then it gets to our brain. It goes through kind of a middleman before it actually gets to the part of our brain that processes memory. Not so with scent. Scientists tell us that scent actually is kind of like hardwired into our memory. So it doesn't go through a middleman, which is why whenever you smell something, it immediately brings back what memories. Like some of you have memories of maybe like a freshly mowed lawn because maybe you mowed a lawn when you were a kid. Or, or for me, the, the, the scent, I love this, of Expo markers. That brings me back to my fourth and fifth grade class. Why? Because we had whiteboards and you would open them and man, it smelled so good. Or, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different memories in the, in the places that they can take you. My favorite, uh, I, I truly love this, kind of my safe place as a kid was the bowling alley. Any of you guys ever go bowling? Of course you have. And I loved going bowling because you'd go into the bowling alley and it was just like this amazing aroma. And what was it an aroma of? Well, it was an aroma of dirty shoes, of oil lane, of, you know, cigarette smoke that's been embedded in the carpet for 30 years. And it's like all of it is together. And it's just like, I'm not kidding. I haven't been to Starlight Lanes in a long time, but I guarantee you I walk in, I know what it smells like even today. And I love it. And I was telling Velissa that one day and she said, that is so disgusting. How could you possibly <laughs> like that smell? But when it comes to smells, smells are tied to memory. Paul's going to give us this example, and he says, listen, when a believer comes in, it's like we're carrying the smell of Christ, an authentic smell, a true smell. And he gives us this metaphor. Let's read it. He says in verse 14, he says, but thanks be to God. So he's talking about my plans changed. I can't come. But thanks be to God who always leads us in tri Christ's triumphal procession 
and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Now pause right here in verse 14. Paul here is, is, is using a, a, his historical description of an event that would happen in the ancient Roman world. And here's basically what it was. Whenever there was a general who would conquer an army or who would achieve a victory, okay, he would then come and bring all those who had, he, had, he had kind of taken capture, right? Those he had taken captive and he would bring them in a parade behind him. And here's what he would do. He would bring them along with some people who would celebrate his victory and he would parade them into the capital. In this case, it was Rome. He would parade them to show all of the victories that he'd won and the people would celebrate as he came through. So think of it like this. Uh, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, they won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago and what did they have? They had a giant parade in Kansas City. Did anyone go to that parade, by the way? Anyone there? No one, no one in either service. You guys are a bunch of poser Chiefs fans. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, but no one went to the celebration. Well, if you saw it on the news, apparently if you weren't there, okay, there were hundreds of thousands. I think maybe it was like over a million people who were in Kansas City for this. And what was it like? The people were going crazy, right? I mean, Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, first time we won a Super Bowl since what? Super Bowl II. Like, I mean, people were going nuts and they go all the way. By the way, who'd they beat? 49ers. That's just extra information for Jason for for, for Pastor Appreciation Month. <laughs> but the parade is going through and people are cheering, right? They're going crazy. But imagine if part of the Super Bowl celebration was the Kansas City Chiefs had to bring the 49ers in tow behind them, right? I mean, imagine that they've got, and they didn't get to shower, they didn't get to change, it's just dirty pads. And, and think of this, think of what that would smell like. You know, for Paul, and we don't know, I'm trying to use some sanctified imagination here. I wonder if he saw one of these parades, but I wonder if as all of these captives were going by who obviously smelled horrible, and I wonder if some of these celebrants who were going by who, you know, maybe they perfumed themselves. Like, as he saw this parade, maybe it was, you know, while he's chained to a guard in Rome or something. He sees this, he smells it. I wonder if it hit his mind. That's what it's like whenever Christ in triumphal procession, vanquished all of the foes of hell and led them in a parade of victory. In fact, he uses this imagery in Colossians. He says that he disarmed all the rulers and powers and authority and he led them in triumphal procession. In other words, all of the hordes of hell are the very people who are the captives that Jesus, by his blood and through the empty tomb, led in triumphal procession. But we, we who belong to him, we get to participate in his victory. So we are the celebrants. We are the ones who are praising Christ in tow with him as he proceeds in victory across the universe, proclaiming that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. We get to participate in that. And here's what Paul says. Through that image, we are the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. In other words, as Christians go, as authentic believers go and spread the knowledge of God, we are doing so in such a way that spreads his aroma. Have you ever, have you ever known someone that had a strong scent? I don't mean this in a bad way. I mean, probably immediately since tied to memory, right? You know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Well, the reason I have this X body spray is this. And, and I'm not gonna spray this. I did in the last service, but I'm, I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to. <laughs> Axe body spray became popular when I was in junior high, or at least in my mind, that's when it all started. Here's why, because seventh and eighth grade, here's what happens. You have a bunch of sweat, sweaty guys who, you know, hey, our bodies are producing a lot of sweat. We go into a, a locker room where we wear the same clothes that we've worn for the last month, you know, and we stuff them in our locker to wear them the next day. But at the end of it, here's what would inevitably happen, right? You've got guys, and it was almost like a competition between Old Spice and Axe body spray. Old Spice became not cool, then Axe became cool, you know. It's like, okay, well, I really smell, so what's the best thing to do? I'm going to spray this all up in the air, okay? And then I'm going to, like, wallow in it, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then I'm going to spray it all up in here, and then I'm going to spray it all up in here. And you just leave. Just, I mean, I, like when I think 7th and 8th grade locker room, I think the smell of Axe body spray. And listen, I had someone after the first service that said, well, it's better than smelly boys. No, it's really not. Like I really don't believe that. And maybe that's because I'm a boy. Maybe all the ladies are like spray the Axe body spray. No, I don't believe that because it's awful. But when it comes to someone's scent, here's what I think a lot of times happens. I think a lot of times we as Christians, we know, man, my actual odor really smells. 
Like, and I've got to do something to cover it up. I mean, Axe body spray is not like a natural odor. It is a cover up for natural odor. And I think a lot of times what we've programmed to do is, no, hey, listen, I I may actually stink. Like, I may smell not like the aroma of Christ. I may smell like the aroma of my flesh. But if I can just learn to cover it up, if I can just learn to spray some nice Christianese language so when the pastor asks me how I do and, oh, Lord, I'm, you know, oh, pastor, I'm counting my blessings. Or I, I might have a Bible verse that I can kind of pull out if someone asks me about my spiritual walk. Or, hey, I'm going to church because, hey, after all, that might give me enough body spray that I can go through and cover it up. Listen, that is not an authentic scent. That's not an authentic smell. That is produced, that is concocted, it is counterfeit, and it is not authentic. And listen to me, when it comes to what the world is looking for, the world is not looking for Christians who are putting a bunch of body spray in the air thinking, oh, I I smell enough to, to seem spiritual. No, the world is looking for Christians who are authentic followers, who are following Christ in triumphal procession. And Paul continues this metaphor. Here's what he says in verse 15. He says, for to God, we are the fragrance of Christ." among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon. Here's here's what Paul is saying. He's saying to God, okay, think about this. As we stand before God, we are the fragrance of Christ. In other words, uh, God is pleased with the fragrant aroma of his children following after his son. This is the language of the Old Testament, of, of offering our bodies as living sacrifices. Paul talks about this in Romans 12. But that echoes back to the idea that God would smell the aroma of the sacrifices. Of course, this is a metaphorical language, but smell the aroma of the sacrifices and be pleased with them. Here's what Paul says. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. But then he says this. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others, an aroma of life leading to life. In other words, that very smell, that very aroma of Christ, to some people, it's going to be repugnant. It's going to smell like death leading to death. To others, it's going to smell like life leading to life. Have you ever had a smell that you disagree with someone else on whether it's a good smell or not? I mentioned the bowling alley example to you earlier. Me and my wife disagree, right? I love it, safe place. She's just like, no, no, no. Another example, this is from yesterday. Veliss and I, uh, Adelaide had a swim meet down in Carthage. We're driving uh, down there. Uh, this is actually Friday night. We're driving, uh, we're driving to go to the swim meet. And uh, so we're like looking into the sun on I-44. And I've got some sunglasses. I haven't worn them in forever. I pull them out. And uh, I've also got like a lens wipe. You know what I mean? Like it's like a little thing of alcohol and it kind of, you rub it. And, it, and so I, I pull it out and I'm like, hey, babe, you know, I'm driving. So we're going down the road. I say, hey, Melissa, would you mind to just like wipe the lens off my glasses while I'm driving here so I can wear these sunglasses? And she kind of takes it and she looks at it and she says, Tim, I just can't. And I'm like, why is that? And here's what you need to know about my wife. I, I love her so much. Like she is like a super sensor. Do you know what I mean? Anyone out here like that? Like, like feelings, like To me, I I guess I'm like a one out of 10 on the sensitivity meter. She's a 10 out of 10. Like smells, one out of 10, 10 out of 10. Taste, one out of 10, 10 out of 10, okay? So so like she's got this this little like alcohol wiping rub. And I say, hey, could you wipe it? No, I can't. I say, well, why not? And she says, well, here's the thing. If I take this out of the package and I put my hands on it and rub them, my hands are going to smell like alcohol for like the rest of the day. She said, I just can't handle it. And I'm just like, Okay, all right. So, so I'm like, all right, I take the glasses. I'm like going down I-44. I'm like driving with my knee while I'm trying to like rub this. And I'm just like, if we die, I mean, just know your hands didn't smell like alcohol. You know, if that was, no, I didn't say that. I'm not that brave. Uh, and and Valis is in the nursery, by the way. So, <laughs> but it was one of those things where it's like, to me, it was just like, well, it just smells clean like an alcohol rub to her. She was just like, I cannot smell like this. And listen, she wasn't, she wasn't being mean. She's not disrespectful. She was just real. Well, have you, ever, have you ever smelled something that's like, for some people, she's like, oh, I love this smell. Other people are just like, this is disgusting. Paul says, that's what Christians are going to be to the world. That for some people, look at what it says, to some we are an aroma of death leading to death. In other words, we smell like dead people. The, the world doesn't understand. Why do you do what you do? Why do you believe what you believe? To, to the world it might seem repugnant 
because we represent Christ. To others, maybe to those that God is working on their heart, God is wooing them, they might sense death, but they might have some kind of other smell where it seems like life and, and, and good, and you, do I like this, do I not? And it's, it's an aroma of life leading to life, but it's different. But here's the thing, here's the thing. We as Christians, as we think about what it means to spread the aroma of Christ, here is our concern. Our concern is not to try and get people who say, oh, you smell like death. Oh, we really don't smell like death. You know, you're just misunderstanding or, you know, no. It's not to convince them we don't smell like death. It's not to say to those who are alive, like, oh yeah, we smell like life. Like, oh, you look at me, I smell great. No, that's not our goal. It shouldn't be. Our goal should be rather to make sure that the smell, the aroma that we are spreading is truly the authentic aroma of Jesus. And here's why. Because here's what is distinctly possible. It's possible for Christians to fall into a couple of different ditches. One is to capitulate with with the culture of the world. And so we don't smell like Christ because after all, we need to be, you know, among, among sinners and smell like sinners and be with sinners. Listen, we need to be with sinners, but to smell like them, to be like them, that's taking it a step, step, step too far. We could capitulate and fall into the realm of, of, of sin and license. But the other ditch is equally as possible. In fact, it may be even more possible. The other ditches for Christians to not have the aroma of Christ, to just bear the aroma of their flesh and think that because the world is repulsed by our flesh that somehow we are truly representing Christ. You know what I mean by this? Let me put it this way. Have you ever had an unsaved friend that you kind of wanted to guard from some of your Christian friends? Like, have you ever had someone who is unsaved, but it's like, you know what? I'm not sure I really want them to, to, to get to know this person or to have a conversation. Or I'm not sure I want this unsaved friend to see this person's Facebook feed. Or I'm not sure I want this friend to kind of like, you know, hear that, that, like, that, that tone. And here's the issue. Sometimes we as Christians will say, well, the world hates us. It's because we're righteous. It's because we're going on the narrow way. No, sometimes the world is repulsed by our aroma, not because it's the aroma of Christ, but because it's the aroma of our flesh that we are pretending is the aroma of Christ. We must bear the true aroma of our Savior. And when we do, will the world be repulsed by it? Yes, but at least they're rejecting Christ and not just rejecting us because we're a jerk. And that's possible. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death. To others, an aroma of life leading to life. And then Paul says this, and I'm so thankful for this because Paul is a realist. He says, who is adequate for these things? And in just a few chapters, Paul's going to say, we are the ambassadors of Christ, as though Christ is making his appeal through us, that truly, when we go out into our community, into our classroom, into our workplace, when we go out, we bear the aroma of something. And Paul says, as a believer, we need to bear the aroma of Christ. We need to bear the aroma of someone who has died to ourselves. We need to bear the aroma of someone who is living for someone else. And we do so not in our own strength, but by the power of God working in us. Look at what he says in the last verse, verse 17. For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. In other words, we don't do it to climb a social ladder. We don't do it because we think there's an incentive or a payoff. We don't do it because we think we live in a culture where, hey, if I say I'm a Christian, you know, people will kind of let me in the door. No, on the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ. And listen, have you found this out? People can sense a fraud. They can People aren't dumb. Like people are going to know if, if you talk to them and you really don't care. Or if you're trying to peddle something on them so that maybe you, you, you buy this or you go to this website or whatever it might be. Like people get that. But Paul says, rather than being fake, on the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. Don't miss that. As those sent from God. In other words, those commissioned, those sent out, those who are given the task of reaching the world for Christ, we go as those from God and, he says, before God. What does he mean by before God? He means we are going to have to stand before the Lord. We're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to go back to the one who sent us out and say, this is what I've done with what you've given me. But Paul says it must be sincere. It must be born of love. 
It must be done in consideration of those who we are trying to reach. Not because we're trying to capitulate, not because we're trying to change the aroma, but because we're trying to present the true aroma of the God who became flesh so that he could die for sin, so that he could set us free. To some, that seems like foolishness. To some, it's a stumbling block. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. At which point the question becomes, okay, so, so how do we spread this aroma? How do we know that it's an authentic smell? How do we know if I'm spreading the aroma of my flesh or the aroma of Christ? Well, there's three principles in our time that we have left that I want to walk through. And the first is this, an aroma of relationship. When I think of uh, people who have different aromas, I'm going to take a stretch here. Uh, I, I think of my dad. My dad has a particular scent to him. And, uh, and I say that because it's a scent that I, I really like. And here's how it kind of started for me. And, and I didn't wake up one day and think, ah, I like the smell of my dad. No. Um, my dad would oftentimes go away on business trips. And uh, when he would go, sometimes my mom would have me or Taylor, my brother, sleep in her bed. You know, and I don't know why she did that. If it was like, a, you know, made her feel more comfortable or like, you know, like a 10-year-old was going to stop a robber if they came in. I don't know exactly what it was. Uh, but we would always sleep on my dad's side, right? My dad's gone, so one of us, you know, sleep there. And so, uh, you know, I lay my head down on the pillow, and what would the pillow smell like? Well, it smelled like my dad, right? Well, it was several years ago, right? I'm, I'm laying down in my own house. I'm out of my parents' house for a long time at this point, but I lay down on my pillow, and I smell something. And like I said, immediately tied to memory, so I go back, and I'm like, this pillow smells like my dad. But of course, my dad had never slept on that pillow, and I started to realize, oh, apparently I smell like my dad. <laughs> and if you know my dad, you know I walk like my dad, I talk like my dad, I look like my dad anyway, so I might as well smell like him. You know what I did to smell like my dad? Absolutely nothing. Except for living in the same house with him for 18 years. And here's my point. When it comes to smelling like someone, if you have a relationship with someone where you're close Inevitably, people who live together and walk together will smell like each other. And that's for good or bad, right? You go in the seventh grade locker room, all of them smell the same. But the reality is there is no replacement for time spent with someone if you want to truly live and present their aroma. And, and here's the thing. At Heritage, if you've been here for a long time, you know this. If you haven't, you're going to come to know it, I hope. It's this, that we talk all the time about having a real relationship with Christ. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him and doing what's necessary to have that relationship. I mean, how many times, and don't check out on me, do we talk about reading the Bible? Do we talk about praying? Do we talk about gathering and worship? There's a reason why. It's not because, oh, I forgot to prepare for the sermon, so what am I going to talk about? You need to read your Bible. Or, oh, you know, I missed this point, or it's not my notes. Oh, so you need to pray. No, these are the only mechanisms that we have to spend time with our Heavenly Father, to spend time with our Savior. And through reading the Bible, through prayer, we come to know Him. That's how we spend time with Him. That's how we begin to smell like Him. As we give our lives over to Him, there is no replacement. Listen, there is no replacement for that personal relationship and personal time with God. And here's the reality, over and over and over again, what happens in our lives, and this is true of me. Listen, I'm a pastor, I love the Bible, I study the Bible, but what happens to me, I know happens to you, is like, well, I kind of forgot today, or hey, I didn't do what I wanted to, and then a day becomes a week, a week becomes a month, and all of a sudden, my life begins to drift, and especially investing in that relationship no longer becomes a priority. Here's the problem. It is in those moments that we spend with the Lord that the Lord promises to come and to meet with us. It's kind of like this. You know, I married my wife. Jason married us right up here. And every day, I want to have a conversation with her. I want to know what she's thinking. It's not enough to say, well, I talked with Felissa last week. Maybe next week I'll check in or maybe in a month I'll kind of like evaluate. No, like that's not how a relationship works. A relationship is continuous. A relationship is meaningful. A relationship is two ways. And listen, there is no replacement for time in the word, time in the prayer, gathering with the saints and worshiping the Lord. It's not rocket science. It's not meant to be. 
but it's a choice that we have to make to invest in a relationship. And here's why. This verse in Lamentations, I hope, is going to feed you today. Look at what Jeremiah said. He said, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, and for his mercies never end. Now, pause right here. This is going to sound very kind of trite. It's going to sound very poetic. But here's what you need to know. Jeremiah wrote this at a time where literally the world around him was burning to the ground. The country that he loved was being led out as captives. The temple that he loved had been raised. Uh, Everything that he knew about life and meaning was falling apart around him. That's when he wrote, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for his mercies never end. And then he said this, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And this might be something that we could put on a coffee cup or it might be something that sounds, you know, very, very nice to our ears. But here's the reality. Why does God say that my mercies are new for you every morning? Here's why. It's because we need his new mercies every morning. That God has a word for you for today. God has a word for you for right now. It's not the same as the word that he had for you yesterday. It's not going to be the same as the word he has for you tomorrow. So if we don't take the time to invest in that relationship, we are going to miss out on the joy that he has for us, on the comfort that he has for our grief, on the wisdom that he has for the decision, for the impression of, of someone maybe he wants us to talk to or reach out to. He gives us new mercies every single day. The question isn't, is he giving them? The question is, are we receiving them? And there's no replacement for this. Listen, there is no replacement for reading your Bible and praying. And you might say, well, I've always found it boring. Listen, Just try. Dive in. We've got a New Testament reading plan. I'm so excited. We're going to roll this out in a month or two when we talk about the new year. We've got a whole new Bible reading plan coming up for the new year. It's easy. It's a chapter a day. Man, the Lord could use it in your life. But just start. Start somewhere. You say, well, I don't know how to pray. Guess what? God doesn't care that you don't know how to pray. He just wants you to come to him with an open heart that says, God, I may be new at this. I may not sound fancy. But I just want to be with you. And over time, it's not like you're going to go out and be like, I'm going to smell like Jesus today. No, over time, as you spend time with Jesus, it's just going to happen. An aroma of relationship next, an aroma of obedience. Now listen, as soon as I say the word obedience, a lot of people think, weight on my shoulders. To obey God means there's some kind of burden that I have to bear. And I want to say up front, I want to say as clearly as I can, what I am not talking about is earning God's favor by obeying. Last night, we got back from this swim meet. We're kind of tired. It's kind of a, a, a low-key night. We ask Adeline and Selah, what movie do you want to watch? We'll watch a movie tonight. And what do they pick? They pick Hercules, Disney animated feature, okay? So it's like, all right, we'll watch Hercules. And uh, we turn it on, and here's the, the basic premise of Hercules. If you've never seen the movie, I'll explain it to you. Hercules, son of Zeus, all right? He becomes mortal, has to live on earth, and here's what he has to do. He has to prove himself. He has to show that he's got a hero's heart. And so he goes through all of these different things. He fights these enemies. He slays these dragons. He does all of this stuff. And eventually, here's the premise of the movie. If he just does good enough, if he can just prove his heart, and if he can just turn into a true hero, then he gets to go back up and live on Mount Olympus. And of course, there's like a love story, so he doesn't want to go to Mount Olympus or whatever. But that's the whole premise is if I just do enough, I can go the distance. I'll find my place and he'll make it back into his father's favor so he can live with him. And as I was listening to this, I thought, listen, that's how so many Christians think about obedience. And so so many Christians think about their walk. It's that, okay, maybe I've got kind of this connection to God, but to prove myself, to prove that I'm really worth something, to prove that I'm really worth my father's favor, his attention, I've got to show my worth by defeating these enemies or by going through this training or by going through this motion. Listen, that is the opposite of what the gospel teaches. The Bible does not say we could earn God's favor. The Bible does not say flex your spiritual muscles and God will be impressed. No, the Bible says that God gave us his favor when we didn't deserve it and could never deserve it. The Bible says that we've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ despite the fact that we are sinners. The Bible says that God's favor was given to us before we were even born in Christ. And yet so many people struggle with the idea that I have to be good enough for God. I have to be good enough for God. Listen, we can never be good enough for God. In part because God says, listen, I have provided you 
with all the righteousness you ever need in my son. So where does obedience come from? If it's not earning the favor of God, what is it? It comes out of the overflow of a heart that's been so captivated, so moved, so enthralled by the gospel that we say, God, you are my Lord. You have shown me that your ways are better than my ways, that your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. God, I want to obey you. Why? Because in obedience there is joy. In obedience there is life. And it's kind of like this. You know, my kids, they're no angels, and I talk about them a lot. I know as they get older and actually get in the service, that's going to cut out. I'm not going to talk about them at all, okay? But my kids, you know, they're not exactly angels. Many of you know that because you have them in, in children's area, right? I mean, I love them. I'm so thankful for them. But listen, if one of them is disobeying, and if one of them is rebelling, guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to, in the midst of that fit, I'm not going to, in the midst of that disobedience, I'm not going to come and say, oh, honey, you know, it's okay, or oh, you know, I'm not going to like, come pander them. No, as a loving father, I know that would be the opposite of love for them. My job as a dad is to what? Discipline them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And listen, I try to do that with kindness. I try to do it with gentleness, but sometimes you have to be firm. Now, here's the difference, and I want you to hear me very loud and clear on this. Here's the difference. As human parents, do we make mistakes all the time? Again, with Paul, who is adequate for these things? So when you think of God as your parent, don't think of, a, of your earthly parent who maybe flew off the handle or maybe went too far, but think of God who has never done any of those things and yet still loves you enough to say, I want you to obey. And you might say, well, that sounds burdensome. Listen, it's not meant to be a burden. It's meant to be a delight, an appropriate action of following after the Lord. Now, don't hear me say, you know, oh, let's put on our spiritual halos and we always want to obey because we're always filled with joy and love for God. No, at times, obedience will cost. And listen, that's the moment when you can test, do I really believe that he is my Lord as well as my Savior? Or do I just want what he has to give me? And yet, in the life of a true believer, there will be an aroma of obedience that says, even when it costs, I'm willing to count the cost to follow God. I love what the Bible does. A lot of times it simplifies things for us. Here's what it says in Micah 6, 8. Mankind, he has told each of you what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. In other words, the Christian faith is not meant to be super complicated. It's not meant to be, do I have a list of 600 commands and am I going to follow them or am I accidentally going to make a mistake? No. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Act justly. Love mercy and faithfulness. Walk humbly with God. Love God. Love neighbor. And the Bible's going to flesh that out as you grow in your Christian faith. You're going to see these commands not as burdensome, but as a path of life leading to life. But listen, when it comes to a Christian, and hear me very plainly on this. If you meet a Christian who says, well, I'm following after Christ, but I'm also living in sin, and I'm happy, right? And this is always the word. I'm happy. It's what makes me happy. Listen, that is evidence that that person does not have the Spirit of God living in them. Why? Because if we're truly believers, don't miss this. If we are truly believers, if we truly have the Holy Spirit of God living in us, then sin will make us miserable, Sin will make us realize, you know, I, I want to have a relationship with my father. I don't want to just you know, know that he's there. I don't want to just know that I've forgiven. I want to live in fellowship with him. It's like a parent with a child. You may have a child. You love them with all your heart. You care for them. They may really be your child. But if they're living in disobedience, that fellowship is strained. And yet some Christians want to continue in disobedience and act as though it doesn't affect their relationship with God. Does he cease being their God? No. Does he cease being their Savior? No. But can they live in the joy that God has for them? No. It's clear. You cannot live in both disobedience and joy at the same time. And when it came to Christ, here was the thing that was so amazing. When it came to obeying, even at a cost, he chose to follow his Father. And listen, a lot of times it's a choice. Uh, it was several months ago, Jason, Kevin, and I decided we were going to uh, have a weight loss competition. Um, so we, this was the plan. We we're going to all weigh in, figure out who was going to lose the most percentage of body weight, and the losers were going to have to buy the winner a ticket to a Cardinals game. I don't know if that's gambling. You can make your own judge on that. 
So we start, it was going to be like a three-month competition. All right, so we start first week, we're going to Subway, you know, like, all right, where do we want to go? All right, we're going to go to Subway. So I had decided at the beginning, this is three-month competition, I'm going to wait till the last month, and uh, I'll sprint to the finish. So I got myself a big sub sandwich and a soda, and I'm like, eh, it's no big deal. Kevin and Jason, they're getting like this protein salad thing, and I'm just like, okay, whatever, that's all, that's all good. Uh, after about a week, we decided to stop the competition. <laughs> and you know why? Because we made a choice. It's not that we, we thought, oh, this is, you know, ah, really, our lifestyle and our eating choices are healthy, and so we don't need to lose weight. No, that's not what it was. It, it was very simply, we do not want to do this anymore. <laughs> but honestly, I think that's sometimes how we view obedience. I really don't want to, even though I know this is unhealthy, even though I know this is hurtful. And we just choose what we want to do. It's not complicated. You don't have to write a theological book about it. It's just disobedience. We do what we want to do instead of what the Lord tells us to do. But an authentic father will choose and say, God, even if it comes at a cost, I'm going to choose your way over mine. Last is this, an aroma of faith. And listen, this is so important. It's so vital. And I believe this is, this is the aroma that I think the world finds the most repugnant. Because as Christians, when it comes to our faith, we are a people who say, even though my eyes cannot see, even though my intellect cannot fully comprehend, even though it might come at a cost, even though I might have to swim against the current of the world, I'm going to choose to trust in God. And listen, the world will come along and say, well, wait a minute. God took your mother or father uh, with cancer. Why on earth would you trust in God? Or the world might say, don't you know that you're missing out on all this enjoyment of life? Why on earth would you live, uh, live frugally now and, and miss out on all that God has? Eat, sleep, and drink, for this is all there is. The world looks at faith and say, why would you give your life, give the comfort of the United States to go across the world to share the gospel in a remote village? Why would you do that? And they look at our faith and they say, your faith doesn't make sense. Same thing in the first century. The Greeks thought that the Christians were morons. They thought that they were horrible and awful and irrational. The Jews thought that they were apostates. They said, you are living in opposition to God. But Paul said, no, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it's so true and it's so amazing that it is worth sacrificing everything else. But we do so not by sight, but by faith. Now, here's the reality. That sounds good, okay, preaching point. Yeah, it might, you know, kind of, okay, yeah, we have faith. But no, the question isn't do we have faith when it's nice. The question is do we have faith when the storm comes? I mean, many of you came today, it's like 65 degrees in October, and it's very nice outside, and maybe you can enjoy it, but here's what we all know. They're saying tonight, tornado, 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 tornado. You might say you have faith when the weather's nice, but the question is, do you have faith when the sirens are blaring, that God is still with you, that God still loves you? I love what Habakkuk said, and this is just a, a brief note about Habakkuk. Habakkuk was, was moaning because he said of God, he said, God, how could you use evil people, in his case the Babylonians, to come and punish your people? Don't you know that the Babylonians are worse than we are? At which point God says, Habakkuk, I'm not even going to debate with you. You wouldn't understand if I told you. But here was Habakkuk's response. In the end of chapter 3 of Habakkuk, here's what he said. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls. Now pause here because I don't want you to miss this. For, for Habakkuk, this wasn't just, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to be hungry for a few days or, oh, I might not have, you know, my, my extra kind of, you know, farm over here to make some extra income. No, this was economic catastrophe. This was, God, if I have no money, if I have no food, if I have no hope of a future, if I have no, no penny to my name and no hope of gaining any, if everything that I can imagine goes wrong, if my country falls apart, here's what he said, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. And I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Why? Because Habakkuk said, it's not about the here and now. It's not about this moment that I'm going through. Habakkuk didn't pretend to understand. Habakkuk didn't pull any punches with God. But at the end of the day, he said, God, where else can I go? Who else has the words of life? I will rejoice in you and you alone. Why? Because you are the God of my salvation. 
You are the God who has made me promises that no one else has. And you've shown those promises by sending your son. Habakkuk said, you and you alone. I love what it says in Psalm 75 verse 3. It says this, when the earth and all its inhabitants shake, or when the earth and all of its people quiver, God says, I am the one who steadies its pillars. I am the one who holds it firm. Listen, we need to be Christians who are marked by a faith that says, God, if you want me to bear a cross, I will bear it. We need to be marked by a faith that says, God, no matter what happens in the economy, no matter what happens politically, no matter what happens relationally, no matter what happens financially, my hope is in you, in you alone. And listen, if we can live that way, if we can have that kind of authentic faith that doesn't cower in fear, that doesn't take a step back, that doesn't capitulate on the one hand, but doesn't live in the flesh on the other. If we can demonstrate that kind of faith, the world is going to smell it. And listen, it may find it repugnant. But here's what the promises of God tell us, is that there are some who will find that foolish way of life. And they'll find an aroma that points them to life. Yes, these people may look like they're dying to themselves, But in the end, God is at work among them. We're not accountable for the response, but we are accountable for our aroma. And so we say with Paul, who is adequate for these things? Here's what I want you to know. Are you adequate? No. Am I adequate? No. But this is why we rely on the power of the gospel. We rely on the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to transform us from the inside out to move in us every single day, to go back to that aroma of relationship, to determine in our minds we are going to make the decision to have an aroma of obedience, to live in the aroma of faith, and to take that aroma out into a dying world that desperately needs to hear it. And listen, for us, it's not about gaining a social advantage. I never want someone to come to Heritage thinking, you know what, I've got to pretend to be someone I'm not. No. That's why we say recreate authentic followers of Christ. It's a process. It's a renewal. It's every day. It's every moment. But at the end of the day, here's what I know. We just want to be real. We don't want to, again, take the spray and say, oh, well, you know, Pastor Tim or Pastor Kevin or Pastor Jason are going to be disappointed if I don't smell like this. So spray, 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 spray. No, no, put down the spray. Let's just go to Jesus. Again, it's, it's not meant to be complicated. It's not meant to be a show. It's meant to be real. Being with Jesus and then showing him to the world. That's the church that I want to be. That's the person that I want to be. That's the church that I want to lead. And by God's grace, I'm thankful Because I believe that's who we are. But as Paul said to the Thessalonians, let's do so more and more and more and continue to spread the aroma of Christ.